Oh. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, we're back again after a couple of months hiatus, I think it'd be fair to say, Rich. Um, yeah. I think it was kind of November last time that we lasted this kind of uh, discussion. So let's just introduce ourselves for those who perhaps haven't watched the other two and encourage you to watch the other They've, two. they've watched it, Tim. They've watched it. But we'll yeah, anyway. whatever. We'll it's gone anyway. viral, hasn't it, mate? <laughs> uh, but I'm Tim from Saltash Baptist Church. And I am Richard Matcham, uh, pastor at Taunton Baptist Church. Fantastic. Now, Rich, we've kind of looked at um, two of the three things we're going to look at, and we've looked at what yeah. it means to believe. Yeah. Um, but our first one was about what it means to to um, uh, belong. And this one is probably a, a slightly more difficult one in one sense. It's what it yeah. means to behave. I suppose the reason we've chosen these three is because there's always been that old understanding, isn't there, of, um, you know, in church life, you believe, you belong and you behave. And over the centuries and over the years, we've seen those in particularly different or different orders. Um, you know, for some people that you actually had to behave first uh, to then believe before you could belong. Um, I think probably there was a very clear, it was a very clear sort of progression, wasn't there? You, huge, you did this you know? first, then this, you know? then this, then this. And you couldn't belong unless you behaved and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Whereas almost now that it's been turned on its head a little bit, hasn't it? That actually yeah. people tend to belong first. Um, they tend to then believe. Um, and then we come to this bit today, which probably is the more, I suppose the most uncomfortable thing that we talk about in churches, but I suppose we have to really reflect on what does it mean for us to behave as yeah. Christians? Um, I think we could probably both tell stories of times when people haven't behaved um, in the way that you would assume Christians would behave. But what I was kind of thinking about this as we were, you know, kind of coming to this, Rich, and I was thinking, actually, it's so important that behaving is not just about following the rules in a church life, which I think it has for so long, but behaving as a Christian is following Christ in a way that others see the difference in our lives and the difference it makes. And I think we, we sometimes, you know, behaving seems to be almost like about following rules, doesn't it? I don't know if you... It, it, no, I think it can have that moralistic overtone. We're living within reach of that sort of Victorian hangover, really, aren't yeah. we, of moralistic preaching. But I still think, though, Tim, that what, what, you, what you just said, that phrase you use, is, is a, oh, yeah, about, li about living so, so that living before others. What was the phrase you just used? I haven't got a clue, mate. No, you just, so <laughs> that it's a witness, so that it's a witness yes. to others or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, I actually still think that's a secondary cause and a reason as well, because we want to live um, well in front of God, in, in any case, because we're children of God. And, and the an entailment of that is, well, so that others may see our lives and, and, and look and maybe ask, you know, some deeper questions. Uh, but but being a witness is for me is secondary. I, I want to live a life well before before my my God and Savior Jesus Christ, who's rescued and redeemed me from the pit, and uh, you know, and that brings about its own response, doesn't it? Which is a, a behaving that isn't a kind of oh just behave or hmm. some sort of um, pietistic moralism, you know, where we just want good behavior because frankly it's easier to deal with people who are outwardly good. Yeah. But I, I'm always, always staggered by the, the fact of the New Testament. Gospels aside, where we see all sorts of dysfunction, Jesus calls out bad behavior, immoral behavior. He does, he does all of that too, but always in such a, a savior, good shepherd-like way. Yeah. But the rest yeah. of the New Testament, Tim, I mean, it'd be great to see you respond to this because we talked about what we're preaching on at the moment and you, do, you like to do thematic stuff. I like to go through books or letters or gospels from start to finish where, where you end up unavoidably hitting things that are quite difficult uh, not people I, I hasten to add like, <laughs> hitting subjects that are quite difficult yeah, and um, yeah, yeah. but 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 the new testament has come into existence in the life in the apostolic era out of profound misbehavior uh, immoral behavior a broken confused behavior and, and that was immediately following, you know, the death, the resurrection of, of Christ. Yeah. And you think without that, we wouldn't know where, where to, what, what peg to hang our coats on, would we? So yeah. I think sometimes we can, we can distort that. We can take that good and distort it into moralism that is just an outward, like a, a pharisaical kind of outward expression. 
But really, yeah. Christianity is definitely about the change of the inward person, that inner transformation that slowly emanates out into the real world, into our lives, which is the real world. Completely. Yeah. I, think, I think it's so important, isn't it? Because I think um, you know, one of the dangers we have in... I always remember um, when I was younger, I don't know, it still happens now, but there used to be hope. Um, uh, the, <laughs> there's always hope. But there used to be an organisation called Hope. And uh, they go around. It's gone now. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> um, but they go around and they do practical things for people, like you know, yeah. clear gardens and all those kinds yeah, of things. Yeah. Amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. And I always remember the kind of critical nature that some people have is why are we doing this? You know, because sometimes we do things because actually we want other people. We want bombs on seats on a Sunday morning. Um, sometimes we do it because yeah, it's evangelistic, and sometimes we do it just because actually we're called to do it but but going back to what you were saying which i think sometimes um this idea of good deeds of of, of actually we, we need to be careful that we aren't just behaving yeah. and, and and you know to make ourselves look good to yeah. make ourselves holier than thou and you're right you know a lot of what we see in scripture it's a i know i believe it's it's god inspired it's breathed by the holy spirit um, but yet, if we look at how it's put together, Rich, and and actually some of the people who who many would revere and hold really highly, it's a mess. Yeah. Um, and actually, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that sometimes it's out of the mess that we 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 see God in the greatest kind of way. I know, that's right. Life. That's right. And I think with Scripture as well, you know, it's it's out of the mess of humanity that made, you know, the mess. That the Roman centurions made of killing Jesus, the mess that um, you know the the Pharisaics community made in not yeah. recognizing. Yeah. Um, it's sometimes in that mess, and and I, and I suppose it's it's in that sense of kind of then saying so. You know, sometimes <laughs> when we're not behaving uh, in the way that perhaps we should, we learn the greatest lessons. Um, but that's certainly not a, a reason to kind of go right. Well, let's stop behaving now so we can learn. Um, no, that's like saying, well, I might as well keep on <laughs> sinning because where sin abounds, grace abounds. That, there's a kind of wrong-headed thinking about that, isn't there? You know? Yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because I kind of wonder, um, you know, if we went back, if we were two ministers talking on Zoom 100 years ago, which I know probably... Would have been, <laughs> Internet um, connection was a bit ropey then, I think. <laughs> yeah, dial up. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, we, <laughs> when we'd be talking about behaviour, we'd be talking about church discipline as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's not something that, that we we particularly talk about these days uh, or even oh, man, maybe no, even feel no. comfortable talking about. No. Um, we've both had times in our ministry, Rich, where we've had to address people, situations, difficulties that, um, that firstly, probably other members, other people in the church don't realise we've had to do. Um, and we've had to kind of say, look, this is wrong. It needs to stop, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I wonder whether actually we we struggle with this whole idea of, you know, we, we can talk about the way our lives behave, but actually behaving in the church, it, it's huge and it's important. And sometimes I, I, you know, you hear people do things and they go, oh, that's only so-and-so, that's just the way they are. Uh, I just wonder whether sometimes we've kind of, uh, we've kind of scared away from bringing out this sense of behaviour in the life of the church. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have, partly because the, the, the idea of discipline, it's a bit like the biblical word submit. Mm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very easy to misunderstand because it's been so abused. Yeah. So, so the husbands that are quite prepared to force their wives to submit because the Bible says, submit to your husbands uh, are very very relaxed when it comes to the next part which is husbands love your wives as christ loved the church yeah so love your wives as christ loved the church so there's a love element there that the bully that wants to force someone to submit tends to kind of overlook and so, so discipline is is one of those it's one of those other words too where we just we can't how, how do we tell people that this is the right way, this is the best way. We're, we're living in a very wealthy, pluralistic, postmodern, or rather we're going into the post-postmodern um, era now, whatever's going on in our mm -hmm. culture. But um, 
the sense that you can't tell me what to do is kind of prevalent. And we see this even in church life, well, especially in church life through the context, Tim, of the problem of, of, of just church hopping, just the amount of people that go to so many different churches when something doesn't go their way or, or they've been rebuffed or ignored or overlooked, whether there's been, you know, whether that's actually happened or not is beside the point. But we just kind of just go somewhere else. And so discipline does become very hard under that, under that rubric. Even, you know, as I said, I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians and Paul in chapter 5 is dealing with this, uh, this, this problem of, of incest. A, a, a man is sleeping with his dead father's uh, wife, which is no doubt his mother and his stepmother. And, uh, and he's livid. Even, even the Greco-Roman world did not allow for such things, never mind the Mosaic law. So you've got pagan, secular, uh, Roman and Greeks saying this is bad. The, the law of Moses saying this is bad. Paul comes, the church saying we don't know what's wrong. What, what do we do about this? Because yeah. he's obviously a powerful guy in the church, you know. What do we do when we, we don't know how to address the powerful, which is another aspect on this yeah. uh, discipline problem. But, but Paul, said, Paul comes in and says, no, 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 you, this has got to stop. This guy needs to repent. You need to hand him over. Uh, he, he actually uses a very enigmatic hand him over to Satan kind of language, which is another way of saying, take him out of the church. And mm. I've worked, I've worked out in my preparation for this, why that is so significant. And, and it's significant because several times Paul says, you know, we are to judge ourselves and those inside the church, yes. but we're not to judge outsiders. So hand him over, let the world who he's also offended be his judge now, yeah. so that he can repent and then be restored to us so even in the discipline tim there was always a, an angle on redemption and uh, restoration which is phenomenally uh, unique to i think to biblical christianity yeah. this idea of re restoration but it's even though somebody doesn't live in a way that is well it's it was it, chapter five of one Corinthians is quite sick mm. incest is perverse it's it's wrong-headed in every single way you know, we uh, so it needs to be responded to, doesn't it? But redemptively, and I wonder whether, sorry to go on to him, but right. I wonder whether yeah. we sometimes miss the redemptive angle on our yeah. on our language around discipline. So when we talk about behavior, we we often want quick conformity because mm -hmm. it makes our life easier, frankly, doesn't it? Discipline <laughs> is working with someone who's needing that input is really hard. I, I wonder just a couple of things, Rich. I think, you know, you know, redemption is central to the Christian gospel message, first and foremost, isn't yeah. it? And I think you're right. You know, in one instance, we have, uh, we not lost, but, um, you know, we, Rich, you will know, and, and many people watching this will know that, um, you know, there are certain things that if they go wrong in the life of the church, they're almost taken out of our hands, you know, and, and a little bit like you were saying with that Greco-Roman world, that actually when there are things that are illegal, or are, are against the law than as a church even, even against the moral law of the universe it's yeah not just it's just wrong-headed isn't it in every yeah. way you look at it and, and, but there are there are times when actually as church or church leaders we need to step back and let other people do uh what what is necessary i think one of the issues that the church has faced for so many years is it's tried to cover up a lot of the things that have gone wrong um and even today we're unpicking that and um, we're living the damage yeah, we are. because of that but actually, but actually, actually Tim, very quickly Tim, to carry on your point but that has a massive impact on our mission and our evangelism huge, and our witness yeah. huge completely i mean I, I i speak to people now and i know michelle does in the university who have been greatly damaged yeah. by some of the ways in which um churches individuals within churches have dealt with situations i wonder though in that place rich whether that gives us as the church the greater sense of being able to offer the rest of the redemption side of things if we're not having to do that um the you know the the, the kind of almost the, the disciplined side of things yeah no i um, agree, to agree to and, and i i do wonder sometimes um if we you know if we we, we are so it's so difficult to talk about this thing. It's like you say, people just get up and leave. And it's almost like it comes back to what we were talking about before, belonging, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, that actually sometimes belonging means belonging in the hard times, the difficult times, the times when we don't know what's yeah. happening. The times when 
we need someone to pull us up by the, you know, and, and to say. We, we need, we do need that. That's part of the discipleship yeah. program, isn't it? And you actually know, for it. us, you know, Rich, um, you know, not to go too much into the ecclesiology of the Baptist Union, um, Oh, but, you know, <laughs> but if you and I do something wrong, we know, um, even if it's just a small misdemeanor, we know we've got people in our region and association who will pull us up and say, right, hang on, that's got to stop or we've got to change. Yeah. Um, you know, in our in our situation, if we do that, we, we, we've really got nowhere to run. We've got to face the music. Yeah. But actually, for, for a lot of people in the church, like you say, they can just decide, well, actually... I'm going to go down to the church down the road and, yeah. you know, and, and start with a clean slate. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, so it's, it's, it's really challenging, isn't it? This is sense of behaving. Cause I think there's different elements. I think we've touched on the whole idea of the way we behave in the world with the way we behave as followers of Christ. Um, but also there's that sense in there of how the way that we behave when things do go wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and I, and I do think that as a church, sometimes, you know, we, if I'm putting it bluntly, Rich, you know, God. me and you both know that there is no central point in the Baptist Union. So if there's a, if we upset people and they leave, um, that's our jobs, our, our calling on the line. You know, if all of a sudden I was to say something or there was someone in the church that did something and they said, right, we're off and we're taking 10 people with us because we're not happy with the way you've responded, we could find ourselves out of ministry in that particular context now i do wonder how much that impacts on and i know we're going down a very baptistic way of looking that's things, a, but that's but, okay tim we are baptists um, aren't we tim? but but i do wonder sometimes whether that subconsciously plays a part in the way in which we deal with some of these situations sometimes yeah it does it does I don't, I, think, I, I don't yeah i can't add to that i think i mean i agree with you tim it does it does have a part because I think the worry for me is, you know, and I, and I say this as as my wife is an Anglican. So, you know, we what? see lots of Anglican churches around who um, have, you know, 10, 15 people in the congregation. Um, but they still have a, a vicar or a priest part of a circuit, but they still have that central. <coughs> you know, you wouldn't have that in a baptistic setting. You, you would very rarely have a church okay. of 10 15 people that could sustain anyone in full-time ministry so I, I think the reason I say that is because I think what that has meant is that in ministry for Baptists and, and for others we, we haven't we we not that we don't want to approach stuff and to sort stuff but there is a sense in which we don't want to upset the apple cart too much um because we could find ourselves you know I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying either of us Rich, have ever thought this, but we could find ourselves in a place where someone goes, "I don't like the way you dealt with this." We're off, goodbye. Ten of our mates are coming as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's always a problem, though, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I, I you've been at Saltash longer than I've been at Taunton, but it's it's true in any in you know relationship between one person and another, or a or a or a, a group of people to another group of people. It, it is true that everything seems fine about them until you get to know them yep. then you start seeing their cracks and flaws and irritations and that's when that's when the rubber hits the road so for example i i've been at taunton you know i'm a relatively new minister here yeah um and a, apart from lockdown i would have got to have known the church a lot better and a lot quicker but let's just say for example i've been here 15 months some people might be thinking, oh, I didn't know that about your personality or didn't know you were wired that way or didn't know that was your preference or your personality, whatever it might be. And, and, and that might grate and, and some, might, some might be loving that. Others might be, you know, kind of um, withdrawing from, from, from the social interaction of church life. Well, they probably have to ask the question why they're doing that. They probably have to ask the question, that, that, that responds where is God in that situation what, what what was it that they were expecting or hoping for and that's in, that's just in the context of ministry but I but I think you know to broaden it out right again Tim mm. and that actually probably uh, me, me thinks I doth protest too much you know but <laughs> but it's not about that but it is about really you know nobody is perfect and 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 I need all the people that God has provided in this church, like you need people in yours, and they need me. Mm. They need me now in this season. 
And um, uh, for example, in my former church at Barton in Torquay, Chris Fry is going in uh, to to replace yep. me, which is absolutely wonderful news. That's an upgrade. Hey, quite hey, what, no, I know, I know. I'm, I'm working on my video for, for Sweden when we do our video together. I know what I'm going to be saying. It is an upgrade. <laughs> but, they, but, but Barton needs someone like Chris Fry right now. Yeah. So, so in that sense, as a minister, she's a gift to them. You're a gift to Saltash. I'm a gift to Taunton without being sort of, you know, yeah. ridiculously big-headed or wrong-headed about it. But, but also the people in front of me and Chris and, and you and, and every other minister are gifts to us as well. Everybody, those that irritate us, those that, those that confuse us, those that, um, you know, are, are strange. And I, I but the, that's the church, isn't it? That yeah. is the church. I think what we're talking about, are we, maybe we are talking about m much less about personalities and those sort of challenges, but more about what are we looking for when somebody comes into the life of the church? Because what we're not expecting is someone to come in in the year 2000, a rough diamond, as we like to say, you yeah. know, we don't want them to be a rough diamond in 20 years. We, we, we want some of the roughness, you know, that is, that, that needs healing and redeeming and, and, and the salve of salvation being applied to it. Yeah. But we want the roughness of grace and love and gospel to be there still, do you know? So, yeah. so, so it's sanctified, it's redeemed, it's, it still has an edge because the gospel should be roughing us up every week. We should be roughed up by the gospel only to find that that's the only place that we should be, not, not somewhere alternative to the gospel. We're not running from it. No. It, it both roughs us up and heals us at the same time. So we've got to recognise that. And Tim, as you were talking, to follow on from all of this, you know, we are mostly dealing with exceptionally comfortable people in our in our yeah. We're living in in a golden era of 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 comfortable uh, leisure. You know, we have we have disposable income that the world history has never seen before. Uh, and I'm talking very I'm talking generally now, but yeah, yeah, we yeah. are we are living in the Western world and, and that's the way it goes and, and that might be changing in any case. But but I I, I think our question of be, um behaving also has to be considered alongside what does it mean to be you know a comfortable, well off middle class professional? Yeah. Because we yeah. don't want to add a veneer of religion to that because Jesus absolutely despised that veneer. And so yet he, he loves people without really, really causing gross offence. Completely. Well, well, just to jump in, Rich, one of the things I was also thinking about is this whole idea of behaving has to find out a way that it's not just about masks that happen on a Sunday morning or when we're in religious places. You know, there's almost a sense in which behaving could be seen as acting, that mm. I, I, I conform. I have to conform to what's expected. I, I play that along. I make sure I do the right things. I behave in the way that is expected of me. Now, one of the things I think I really want to challenge both the church here at Saltash and the worldwide church, and and I, and I, I this is not a sweeping statement, but I think a lot of our churches have become incredibly middle class. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that as a criticism. No. But what I'm saying is we are because we we are part of that today. Yes, I, I, I do get you. I think I think it can be an easy snipe for maybe pioneer ministries or yeah. the evangelists who can sneer at the middle classness, but there's nothing wrong with there's nothing no. wrong with with discipled middle class no uh, people exactly. in, in, in England, you know. But, or, I, but or, I think or, I think it's interesting. Um, several years ago when I was in Bristol, I did half a day placement for a year or so uh, at the local prison. Um, at Hallfield uh, HMP Bristol nice. and um, and interestingly one of the things that you deal with when you're doing a service there is people do not know that during the sermon you don't shout out questions now I'm not saying you don't do that but you would be preaching it's brilliant isn't it <laughs> and yeah and, and oi part yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. what a load of rubbish father <laughs> what's that mean now, now you bring that into a context where they come into a church and, 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 you know, if you sit them down, all of a sudden they shout, Oi, vicar, minister, pastor. What's... So, so, so actually, and, and, and I think in one sense, the other thing I would say along that is we've become very comfortable, you know, that actually church doesn't disrupt as much. 
And one of the things that we really at Soul Clash are trying to kind of lead the church through mm. is that there is room for everyone. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, which yeah. means that there is room for the middle class. There is room for the the high class. The, you know, and let's well, move it away from right, but let's move it away from class. There is room for yes, those who yes, are comfortable, yes. that, but there is room for those who have been to church and know the rules of how we do church. But I think those rules have, have brought us into a corner where we're struggling to get out of. Whereas mm. actually there will be a new group of people for us as church, we hope and pray, particularly dealing with homelessness in the town that we're doing with church mm. and debt pre debt prevention. Yeah. Um, we are going to be meeting people who perhaps have never walked through the, the doors of a church in their life in the past, and they don't know how to behave. And my biggest fear is that almost we turn them into those that con that kind of conform and you know in, in one sense it's not that they teach us anything it's that we teach them everything and actually you know when we come into the sense of what it means to behave i think we're going to have to really open our doors far more to see um you know these people coming in and actually changing who we are. Yeah. So that actually our sense of behavior. Tim, the chance would the chance would be a fine thing, wouldn't it? To, I, I think one of the one of the things that we are uh, struggling with is is declining church in the Western world in a general sense. Yeah. So any local church in the Western world needs to understand that uni universal trend mm. in, in order to you know to, to breathe a bit more deeply, to trust God a bit more deeply as well. But we do it because we want, like you said earlier, we want bums on seats because it makes us look good. Yeah. It makes us look successful. But, but the, the, I think the whole cultural wheel is turning in such a way that uh, that we, we're, we're moving into a post-Christianized culture where people don't know uh, uh, what, what, to, what to do or, or whatever in church. Now, some, pe some of those people will come in and they'll be very pleasantly surprised at how gracious and kind and and how relatable a lot of people are in the church. Others go in and have really bad experiences. Okay, a plague on that church, if that's the case for them, if they're being sort of overprotective or overbearing or overly uh, doctrinally precise, that's just, there's a place for that, but it's probably not on a Sunday morning in the yeah. context of greeting people. But just to make a little hair, 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 hair um, width distinction in your comment about people that you took the prison, yeah, shouting out the homeless people could maybe coming in who don't know anything about it. That's fine. But I, my experience has been with people who don't go to church in a in a in a biblically illiterate culture, in a non-churched culture, in an unchristianized culture. Um, the, uh, my experience has e been equally split between the people on the one hand, which is what we're largely talking about, and what they think God is like because they don't want to. They, they think God is fussy and yeah. God is pernickety and God is going to, you know, judge them harshly yeah. if they are not nice people or if they don't sit in the right or whatever. I, I certainly had that with a load of sixth form uh, uh, philosophy and ethics students who came in asking loads of questions, asked loads of questions about um, about church life and everything. And and it was incredible. One of, one of the one of the girls in the group that we were in a large group, a crowd of of these these. 16 17 16 17 year old kids really smart kids you know but completely saturated in the secular individualist materialist worldview mm. even though they're doing religion and ethics which i thought was wonderful they said why do you do what you do and i said because i'm responding to god's love for me yeah. and everything everything else is detail but that's my yeah i'm responding to god's love that's what i think being a christian is and um and they said, and so this one girl in the group asked, what do I mean? And I thought, I thought on the hoof, what could I say that would convey what I mean in this situation with all these kids listening, probably about 12 of them around me and the teacher. Mm. And I said, well, how else would you respond when you know that God is crazy about you? And I, and she said, well, that's fine for you. But what about me? I said, yeah, I'm talking about you. God's crazy about you. And she burst into tears. <laughs> you have that effect on people, mate. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, because there was no no conception at all that she, it was that the view was, and this was in our subsequent discussion, 
that you had to kind of just be good and get on and be nice and help old ladies across the road and do their do their shopping and tidy their gardens and 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 sing the songs on a Sunday and say your prayers at night. Yeah. What about responding to God being crazy about you? I mean, that changes everything, doesn't it? Oh, well, completely, completely. And it, and it's interesting. Um, Michelle in her daily thoughts has been doing uh, the Beatitudes. And um, you know, where, where's this? Where she is that at the university? Thing? At the university, yeah. Where she works, yeah. And um, and she, you know, we we sat down and we were just talking about it one night. And um, you know, if you look at all the beatitudes in some context, we we do them because God first did them to us. Amazing. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I, you know, God first loved us. Therefore, the love that we have for God and the love that we then spread out to others is because of God first loved us. Yeah. Um, I always uh, remember Chris Ellis, uh, his book on worship leading, encountering yes. God is a double work because actually, um, you know, God first encountered us. So therefore, you know, Sorry. we encounter God. And, and 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 I think in one sense we have we have to really regain or re, re, regain this understanding that all that we do is because God has first done it to us, and and even in the sense of behaving, isn't it the way we are, the way we do things, the way we treat people, we, yes. we use God as our our model. Yeah. Um, I so, think so. My, yeah, it's gone. To, sorry, Tim. Go no, I was going to just say you took a breath and pause. It was my moment to pound. Yeah. yeah so. no, I'm, <laughs> Well, oh, because I was going to move it on a little bit. Do you want to say yeah. something about that? No, I was just going to say it's exactly the argument that Paul uses in in one Corinthians eight. I did oh, a mini. Are you I preaching? A, are you preaching a sermon on this scene by any chance? Well, right? in a few weeks I will. But yeah, but I did a mini bite-sized video. Third reference to one Corinthians. I, I know. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, you can tell, <laughs> can't you? I'm saturated at the moment. But I did. A, I did the mini bite-sized video recording earlier today of one Corinthians yeah. eight. And the point is, it's about the meat sacrifice to idols. Some are saying, well. You know, I've got the knowledge that, that idols mean nothing, therefore I could eat meat sacrificed to idols even though I'm a Christian. And, yeah. and, and Paul's argument is, look, the younger, weaker Christians will struggle with that when they just see you galloping down your roast beef on a Sunday, even yeah. though they know that they've got problems with that. And they... But he says the paradigm is not knowledge because it was all about power and control and self-assertion in Corinth. Paul says it's about love. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Therefore... Your, your response should be one of love and then you should withdraw from that act of eating meat in case your brother or sister stumbles yes so so love becomes the paradigm and when yes. when you mentioned the the beatitudes in matthew 5 and um well matthew 5 isn't it yeah, yeah. you know that jesus himself personifies living out the beatitudes Completely. and where do we see that love of god is on the cross yeah, you know it, that's where they're, that's where they're fully expressed. Completely, you know? and, it, and it's 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 almost as if you know well, we know that the, the beatitudes are almost the the kind of mantra, the the kind of you know Jesus is kind of this is what I'm going to be about. This is uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word. When we do, we've domesticated the beatitudes. Yeah, but yes, yeah, exactly. And I think you know, and, and actually, all that we've looked at about, about believing, belonging, and behaving has to be seen through yeah. the eyes of the cross. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's so vital. And I do think we need to you know, get back this idea of all that we do that is good, that is wholesome, is because God has first shown us. Yes, um, that's right. Everything's a response. Exactly. God. It demands a response. Um, you know, I think, you know, I say to many people that w when you hear God speak, you can't keep quiet. If you keep quiet, that's a response. There is, you can't not respond. Um, so, so you either respond positively or negatively. And if you sit there quietly, ignoring it, you're responding negatively. Yeah, it, it you demands, responding, you know, yeah. It demands yeah. a response. But I, I think something you just said earlier kind of just has, has stuck with me. This idea of, a, you know, this, this Christian that comes in 20 years ago, um, you know, mm. it's so easy in church life to lose that fire, to lose the, the yeah. desire. The first love. Yeah, the first love. And it's so important. I think one of my... My concerns is that people lose that so easily, yeah, yeah. and they still believe and belong and behave, but slowly you can just see them throughout time drifting to the edge of church life. Um, and before you know it, you know you've got people who are writing you letters saying that church is no longer for me. You know this is um, 
you know, and, and, and actually, you know, there's a sadness in that actually that we haven't yeah, picked up, is. or I haven't, or whoever haven't picked up earlier, that kind of sense of. But also, Tim, to be fair, to be fair to that scenario, which is which is common, mm. people do drift in that sense. There's all sorts of reasons for it. It's not just because they're bored with church or bored with you or bored with everyone else. Their sin can mask so many other complicated motivations, can't it? Yeah. So, so we end up creating justifications and reasons why we do what we do. And I, I kind of, I like Martin Luther's understanding of, of or his comment on, on um, you know, on our, on our motivations and our desires when he says, he says that Christians really do what we, we do what we really want to do. Mm. And, and if you want to withdraw from church life, something else is going on there yeah. that is kind of allowing you to do that. You justify yeah. it. Um, and, and I think that's where church discipline under the pastoral ministry can come in. The yeah. pastor or the pastoral team or the el- whatever it might be, whatever structural apparatus you have, mm. need to come in and lovingly say, what is really going on here? Mm. Not just the surface stuff of withdrawing. What's really going on? Where is God in this situation for you? Yeah. So, for example, Tim, you've been called to be a pastor at Saltash Baptist Church. If, if people who voted and were part of that discerning process voted for you enthusiastically, suddenly within you know five or six, seven years, start to withdraw because of you, mm. um, the suddenly are, are, are they are they then denying that god called you well yes and they have to reckon with that fact so, yes. so, so something else is going on and it's very difficult for me to explain because i'm just kind of thinking on the hoof about yeah, it yeah no but i know you see it. this ebb and flow all the time in church yeah. life don't we? but I, I wonder whether um you know this is a little bit of an aside um you use the word sin there and I, you know and i wonder whether We've done ourselves an injustice. I know growing up, wonderful, you know, I, I, I do not bemoan anything that happened in my spiritual life, you know, but I kind of yeah, wonder right. whether we, I got too stuck on the idea of, this, of sin is the things we do wrong. And I, I think we've done ourselves a misjustice yeah. there because actually I would want to talk about sin now and what I've gone through is sin is anything that stands between us and, and a relationship with God. Um, so sometimes those things are not sins in of themselves. No. Um, you know, I, I know many people who have the whole struggle of, you know, sports on a Sunday morning. Now, sport. Oh, itself, hopefully, hopefully not so much now, but yeah, yeah I know exactly. That used yeah. To be a thing, but, yeah. But sport in itself is, is not a sin. Eating food is not a sin. Eating meat, sacrifice to idols is not a sin. But if it causes someone else to stumble, then it does become a sin. Yeah. yeah. And actually, but actually, what I think what I'm saying that is because actually we need to see sin broader than just the stuff that we do wrong. Sin is anything that gets and hampers in our relationship with God. Yeah. And and therefore, you know, when we're talking about you know people who are making those kind of choices of walking away, or when people aren't behaving as they should, actually sometimes it is purely. Because something else has taken their love, their first love. That's right. Something's come along. You know? yeah. And sometimes it's as simple as I want my Sunday mornings back. I think that's a good which, which actually is a reasonable thing to say, isn't it? When you're working, when both, when it takes two adults to sustain a household these days, give or take. Yeah. If you're lucky enough to have a job that provides one, then great, good for you, and uh, and God bless you. But but let's be honest, most most families are pushed right to the wall and to the wire well, on this, aren't It's they? interesting, and I, you know, and I, we have a, a great men's breakfast that happens here on a, on a Saturday morning. I haven't received my invitation, but okay, go no, on. Oh yeah, well, that's because it's great, and we don't need to. <laughs> you don't um, need me there. Uh, and someone said once we don't get many young young people oh. to it. And I said, well, <laughs> you, you'd obviously be adding to that argument. Yeah. Um, but I said because the problem is, is that. You know, and a bit interesting to see in a post-COVID world, people are working their socks off during the week. They get home from an evening, they have a meal, and then they've got to take someone out for this, that, and the other, and all that. I know. And then all of a sudden, they've hardly seen each other all week. And what yep. does the church do? Come on, men, come out on a Saturday morning and um, stay away from which, your which might work for people who are, you know, retired and, and that's their what that's their one or two social events yeah. of that week and so on. And, and I get, and we just have to have grace around all of those things, exactly. don't we? We just do. I think just a, yeah. a big pile of grace. But you know, the, uh, talking of sin, 
Oh, that's my favourite subject. Oh, here we go. <laughs> anyway, where do I begin with Tim? Sit Butler? down, everybody. Uh, sit down. Brace, buckle up. Yeah, brace yourself. Um, we, we, I think we can be a little bit wrong-headed about that too. Sin, sin is very much an external thing, which is why our outward conformity can affect our behaviour. Um, and although we have in the church life the language of the heart, we are very much focused on what we can see and observe and hear yes. and so on. Yes. Now, the Anglican communion, the Anglican church have, in, as part of their prayer liturgy, uh, we have sinned in thought, word and yeah, deed, indeed. which is which is like pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah. Thought, word, but I want to say, and I've, I've used this argument in, uh, I think I used it in one of my essays. I was quite pleased with myself, actually. Um, it's worse than that. We've sinned in thought, word, deed, and to use a very fancy word, our ontology, our being, the essence of our being. We are sinners, Sentient. not just in what we do and say, but yeah. by the very nature of our being. Yeah. And so that's why we pray the Lord's Prayer every day. We are, and in doing that, we are inviting forgiveness. Well, we might come to the Lord's Prayer and say, well, I haven't sinned in thought, word, and deed. I'm okay. No. Your being, your, your, your being is being sanctified, it's being redeemed, it's being restored. And, and so we have that, that forgiveness uh, clause in the Lord's Prayer in the Christian faith in general. Because even when everything is going well in thought, word and deed, oh, darn it, my actual, my molecules are against me, you know, my, the essence of my being has got me. And there I can pray forgive me my sins yeah um and and that and, and that's when we can do some really deep work with god you know rich we're probably coming to an end now oh i uh, just thought that was the intro but okay i, <laughs> I could hear your voice all day tim just, i know <laughs> but i'm just i'm just kind of reflecting on some of the things we've shared about we've, we we feel about this whole idea of of behaving and you know it's more than just we want to look like we're good we're right there's got, oh, to, be it's got to be more it's got to be more than that, to that. Yeah, in church life, if we belong to church, if we truly belong to one another, then as long as it's done in love, calling out someone and saying, look, I'm not sure this is right. Yeah. Um, just one little side. I always think the words, I say this in love, is a big cop-out in life. Um, although, although, Tim, although I, I agree with you, I think it has been used as a cop-out. Famously, we use yeah. that as a kind of... But, but, but actually, genuinely speaking the truth in yeah. love is a very grace-filled moment, isn't it? Exactly. But what we often do is we often say, "Brother, I'm going to speak to the truth in love to you now," and, and then you tear and the person to shred. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, put them through the yeah. mincer or something. You know, that, exactly. that's just that's not exactly. that's not the life of grace at all. No, know? we've talked a bit about church discipline as well, Rich, and and the complications bit. and the difficulties that brings. Yeah. And I think that is that's. I mean, it's all tied in with belonging, isn't it? Actually, um, you know, that sense of if we truly belong, then we're truly. Uh, giving ourselves over to to, to one another yeah um, and, and it's that early early church kind of you know way of working and living to another so I think you know whereas I think behaving is one of the more difficult aspects I think it's a huge aspect and, and actually has so many different layers yeah um, than even maybe belonging and, and believing actually has uh, and it's and I think but I think it's I think what we've probably shown more than anything it's a huge struggle that we still have to contend with we do um as we, we do. kind of seek to serve god as we believe and right. as we belong behaving is important but it but it certainly has its own challenges so um, it does and, I, and i'll end with this tim i mean i totally agree with you there i think this has probably been the most in, uh, agreeable one uh, of the three that we've had because right. we, we kind of we, we mostly agreed in the other two to be fair didn't yeah. we but i i think in the context of behaving and, and what it means to be part of a grace community, which is another word, you know, another couple of words for church, mm. which is what it should be, frankly. You know, we, we, grace is one of our buzzwords, but we don't really plumb its depths. Al, um, uh, Philip Yancey in his What's So Amazing About Grace, which I read in the 90s, was profound. It's well worth revisiting that book yeah. to understand the depths of grace and how damaging I think church life can be for some people. When, when we lose sight of grace, it's, grace is not a weakness, it's a strength. Yeah. And I would, I would, my final comment, Tim, would be this. Think of the person that you most want to spend time with and then ask yourself why. And I suspect that grace will be there. You know, yeah. you can be yourself 
you feel safe, you feel secure, you feel understood, you feel heard. That's exactly what we should be as church. But in the meantime, we've got real life to deal with, but we've also got grace as a gift. You know, so uh, grace is there as a, as a massive thing in terms of our behavior. If, if you fall, Tim, or if I fall in sin that has a public effect on our ministry, the church can never throw us to the wolves, but it must, it must bring discipline to bear that brings about re restoration and redemption. And that's the same for pastoral ministry as well, isn't it? Well, we'll end on your wise words. And uh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rich, for these last three sessions. Tell you, it's always brilliant to talk to you. Thanks we, so much. We, we might pick a whole new subject and start again. And be a well, bit when, when this one goes viral, Tim, and we should, yeah. we should, we should get the people to clamour for us to speak more on subjects and, uh, and, and see what happens, you know. But that's, I have to say, the, several well, people because... have loved our conversations uh, from Taunton uh, and yeah. uh, one or two from Wider as well. So it's yeah, been no, that, and the same as Saltas. I think maybe if people want to comment on, on things they want us to talk about, then that would be great as well. And we'll, we'll, well like, only if it's nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we'll, um, we'll stop the recording now. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Good to see you.